Welcome to the fifth video in the series devoted to singing early music. In this session, I'll introduce concepts relevant to 18th century performance. The bonds between speaking and singing remain strong throughout the century, and singers continue to use the orator as a model. In 1771, Anselm Bailey described recitative as an expressive and elegant manner of speaking in which singers should ask themselves how an orator would pronounce the words, preserving the grammatical connection. And in 1803, Charles Dibden praised two of the greatest singers in the latter part of the 18th century for their speech-like delivery. Those who get at the force and meaning of the words, and pronounce them as they sing with the same sensibility and expression as it would require in speaking, possess an accomplishment in singing beyond what all the art in the world cannot convey. Elizabeth Sheridan and Gertrude Mara were, according to my idea, the most accomplished singers I ever heard, because they were taught upon this principle. Like earlier singers, 18th century performers treated the written page freely, personalizing the music through both major and minor modifications. And around 1781, Domenico Cori characterized the relationship between notation and performance candidly. Either an air or recitative, sung exactly as it is commonly noted, would be a very inexpressive, nay, a very uncouth performance. Cori's comments resonate throughout the period, and treatises advise singers to pay much more attention to expressing the passion of the subject than to following the notation mechanically. The principles governing this recreative style of singing were well known in the 18th century, and if we become familiar with the range of strategies prominent singers of the time employed to liberate music from the written page, we can begin to avoid the uncouth performances Corey associated with literal readings of scores. The influence of speaking on singing persisted throughout the century, with four areas providing the foundation for 18th century vocal style. Pauses and cadences, accent and emphasis, light and shade, primarily mesa de voce and portamento, and tempo alterations, both rhythmic rubato and the quickening and retarding of the overall time. Phrasing continued to be governed by the stops speakers and singers placed at points of punctuation, as well as other convenient locations. And towards the end of the 18th century, these two categories were being called grammatical and rhetorical pauses. The role of punctuation in this regard had not changed since the 16th century, and grammatical pauses separated sentences into their main constructive parts, so that grammatical construction became audible. Rhetorical pauses introduced stops in places where although an articulation never would have been indicated, the sense of the sentence called for one. By incorporating stops before or after important ideas, speakers and singers arrested the attention of listeners, not only leading audiences to expect more to be said on the subject, but also helping performers appear to speak or sing spontaneously. Although judgment and feeling ultimately governed the introduction of rhetorical pauses, a number of principles guided speakers and singers. Stops were used before prepositions, conjunctions, relative pronouns, and certain adverbs. And pauses also separated subjects from verbs, verbs from their complements, and parenthetical remarks from the rest of the sentence. Several writers commented on the necessity of stops for both speakers and singers, Anselm Bailey stating in 1771 that a just observation of stops will illustrate the sense, but an improper use will obscure it, either in speaking, singing, or writing. A few years later, William Cocken wrote, in both speaking and singing, like blank spaces and pictures, Pauses set off and render more conspicuous 
whatsoever they disjoin or terminate. Speakers still drop their tone of voice just before the stops, and in the 18th century, this facet of delivery became known as cadence. Because the frequent insertion of stops created short fragments of text that might sound disjointed if they were not exited gracefully, singers regularly employed, in Corey's words, a dying or diminuendo of the voice, both at the ends of phrases and all those places where the singer finds it necessary to take breath. Corey further recommends that, on the last note of a passage, always die the voice, and at each note of the final phrase, end thus. This swell must be done as gentle as possible, only as much as to accent the sound and immediately die it away. In fact, in 1785, an Italian writer insisted that singers should not dwell too long on the last note of a passage, or else they would lose the opportunity to take breath. For many performers, then, the ultimate notes of phrases, whether internal or concluding, were abbreviated in performance, and Domenico Cori's anthologies of vocal music illustrate this facet of phrasing. In both fast and slow tempos, the last notes of internal and final musical periods were shortened. But on occasion, Corey lengthened these notes, foreshadowing an approach used in the 19th century. In 1847, Manuel Garcia mentioned that the note which ends a final period should be longer than all the other final notes, because it marks the completion of a thought or discourse. Accent and emphasis, two of the basic components of good expression, were as essential in singing as speaking. Accent refers to the stress laid on the appropriate syllable in a multisyllable word, and emphasis to the force placed on important words so they are distinguished above the rest. However, it wasn't until the early 19th century that writers on singing began to write extensively about accent and emphasis, and if composers committed the barbarisms of improper accent and false emphasis, singers were expected to correct the problems. In 1820, William Kitchener pointed to a passage in Handel's Let the Bright Seraphims that, if sung literally, would fail to produce a good impression. Specifically, singers might falsely emphasize the words let and there, and incorrectly accentuate uplifted, if they read the notation literally. The longer values Handel assigned to let and there emphasize the wrong words, instead of bright and loud, which are the correct ones, and the crotchet or quarter note Handel assigned to the final syllable of uplifted would accentuate the last syllable and not the middle one. To bring the passage closer to speech, Kitchener altered the note lengths Handel had provided. His solution to the problem followed well-known principles of prosody and emphasis, and in the 18th century, speakers were expected to reserve the strongest sound of the voice for the most significant word or idea in a sentence, while relegating unimportant words to relative obscurity. In 1771, Amselm Bailey provided a list of these unimportant words, which primarily were articles, prepositions, conjunctions, and auxiliary verbs. These non-emphatic words, he says, should be run off lightly and somewhat hastily. Bailey also warns speakers not to fall into the absurd habit of placing an emphasis on every word or syllable as is the practice of some, a fault which in the early 19th century became known as continual emphasis. Beyond these facets of expression, the use of mesa de voce and portamento were also considered to be essential components of eloquent delivery. Domenico Cori called the swelling of the voice the soul of music and the famous 18th-century castrato Farinelli was still remembered in the 1830s 
for his control of the technique. Farinelli moved his audience to a state of ecstasy by the manner in which he commenced one of his famous songs, the first note of which was taken with such delicacy, swelled by minute degrees to such an amazing volume, and afterwards diminished in the same manner to a mere point, that it was applauded for five minutes. We learn in the early 19th century that this aspect of singing had its roots in speaking. In 1826, Thomas Phillips pointed out the connection. The natural speaking of words would prove dissonant to the ear if the sustained syllables, either vowels or liquid consonants, were to be given with equal strength, instead of a swell and decrease. In speaking, we employ it without being aware that we do so. The variety of dynamics these applications of light and shade created help singers prevent that fundamental defect of expressive singing, monotonous delivery. Carrying the voice from one note to another through a sliding motion also came from speaking, and in 1810 Corey grouped both the swell and the slide under a single term and related both techniques to speaking. Portamento de voce is the perfection of vocal music. It consists in the swelling and dying of the voice, the sliding and blending one note into another with delicacy and expression. The portamento de voce may justly be compared to the highest degree of refinement in elegant pronunciation in speaking. Although not mentioned in the 18th century, if singers can hear where these devices occur when they speak the text, they will know where sliding and swelling will sound the most natural in singing. Beyond the application of cadence, pauses, accent, emphasis, sliding and swelling, variations in the speed of delivery continued to be of importance in the 18th century. Under the heading, Quickening or Retarding of Time, Domenico Cori wrote, Another improvement, by deviation from strict time, is to be made by the singer delivering some phrases or passages in quicker or slower time than he began with, in order to give emphasis, energy, or pathos to particular words. At another point in his treatise, Corey provides further explanation of how singers can discover where such changes of expression would be appropriate. Singers ought rigorously to adhere to the meaning of the subject which they may easily do by first reading the words with attention. The voice can then be regulated in the manner that will best enable the singer to give to the passage the degree of energy or pathos its subject demands. He then goes on to say that without such appropriate execution, no effect can ever be produced. As part of the way singers breached the regularity of tempo and rhythm, they also employed tempo rubato or stolen time, which Corey defined as a detraction of part of the time from one note and restoring it by increasing the length of another, or vice versa, so that whilst a singer is, in some measure, singing ad libitum, the orchestra, which accompanies him, keeps the time firmly and regularly. Both of these fundamental alterations to the notated text heightened expression by allowing singers not only to correct barbarisms, such as inappropriate accentuation and false emphasis, but also to heighten the expressivity of particular words and sentiments. I close with a list of the sources that have been cited.